This is Smart Pizza, and in this episode, you'll see animals living in hell, sharks living in volcanoes, inhabitants of the depths of the Mariana Trench, incredibly resilient creatures that survived the Ice Age, as well as strange and even anomalous animal behavior. Let's go. Mysterious Cuttlefish at the Bottom of the Well Today's episode opens with a story full of mystery, but don't be too quick to judge it skeptically. So this incident, which occurred in a small settlement, became known in 2015. According to witnesses, the incident occurred at the neighbors who decided to clean the well. On the appointed day, workers arrived at the site, pumped out the water, and then began to clean the well with buckets. After a while, the bottom appeared, but when the workers began to pull the last bucket up, they saw something moved in it. When it was dumped on the ground and poured with water, the workers saw an incomprehensible creature that looked like a cuttlefish. But the surprising thing is that the main habitat of the sea creature is the Atlantic Ocean, except for the American coast and the Mediterranean Sea. In the end, people were undecided on the species of the animal but noted the terrifying appearance and tentacles. Be that as it may, science cannot yet confirm this story as there's insufficient evidence. According to researchers, the appearance of the cuttlefish can be explained by erratic currents or due to natural disasters. But what's surprising is that the observed sea creature didn't correspond to some external figures of the cuttlefish. In general, cuttlefish are sea creatures, which together with octopuses and squids belong to cephalopods. Their appearance is unusual, and their ability to skillfully disguise themselves by changing their color is simply amazing. Cuttlefish live in the warm coastal waters of the Mediterranean, Baltic, and North Seas. Interestingly, they can reach speeds of up to 18.6 miles per hour all thanks to a special funnel-shaped water ejection system. It's worth noting that cuttlefish do have tentacles with which they hunt. A lot of time they lie on the bottom and grab passing fish with their long tentacles. However, they can also rush off to the prey if the prey is large. Despite large fisheries, the cuttlefish population is not threatened as they're quite common animals. What do you think? Do you think the cuttlefish story is a common legend or a future world scientific sensation? Share your thoughts in the comments, and stay tuned to see the planet's creepiest deep-sea creatures you'd better never encounter. Goblin Shark In fact, this creature has many different names – the Goblin Shark, Scapinorhynchus, or Mitsukurina. It's a deep-sea shark, the only surviving member in the Mitsukurinidae family of sharks. The Goblin Shark got its name for the bizarre appearance. The snout of this shark ends with a long beak-like growth, and the long jaws can be extended far. Coloration is also unusual. Its color is close to pink as blood vessels shine through the translucent skin. The largest individual known to science reached a length of 12.4 feet and weighed 463 pounds. Until relatively recently, scientists thought this species was long extinct, but about a century ago the fish was caught and researchers became aware of the existence of this shark. The goblin shark has special receptors on its body, which the fish uses to track its prey. However, scientists still don't know what exactly these predators eat, because the moment the shark was lifted from the depths of the sea to land, it immediately turned its stomach inside out, getting rid of all of its contents. Black Swallower Many predatory fish, most of which are deep-sea dwellers, can boast of extraordinary veracity. It's not because of their greed and vicious appetite, but because of the limited food resources in the depths of the ocean. Therefore, if they encounter any prey on the way, it will certainly be eaten, even despite its size. One such voracious fish is the black swallower, or chiasmodon. The genus has only seven species, but the most famous and widespread of them is the black swallower. It lives in tropical and subtropical waters of all oceans at a depth of 492 to 13,000 feet. Rarely, the length of this fish exceeds 6 to 8 inches. But thanks to its wide open mouth, the black swallower is able to swallow prey that's much larger than its size. Scientists assume that the black swallower grabs its prey from behind and swallows it starting from the tail. In order to find prey in pitch darkness, black swallowers have a well-developed system of lateral line organs like many other deep sea fish. It picks up low frequency vibrations of water, allowing the fish to determine the location of potential prey. Earlier black swallowers were thought to be rather rare inhabitants of the sea depths, but studies carried out in the second half of the 20th century proved the opposite. Scientists found that these fish are an important link in the food chain of tuna and marlins. Pelican Eel The pelican eel belongs to the Sacopharyngiforms. Its 
also called the gulper eel or the pelican gulper. As you may have already noticed, the fish got its name because of its huge jaw and leathery sac on the lower part of its mouth, which helps it catch prey like a pelican does. The pelican eel has a mouth volume of up to 6.1 cubic inches, which is 11 times its body volume. Pelican eels inhabit the temperate and tropical belts of all oceans at great depths of 1,600 to almost 10,000 feet, and that's why they're poorly studied. Basically, the features can be judged from individual specimens accidentally caught in fishing nets. Pelican eels feed on crustaceans, fish, and squid. Although the enormous jaw and sack of pelican eels allows them to swallow prey several times larger than themselves, no prey longer than four inches was found in their stomachs. This means that the nutrition process of the pelican eel is not arranged like that of a pelican, but rather like that of a whale. Together with a small prey, it swallows the huge amount of water, which it then gradually gets rid of. Interestingly, the skin of the pelican eel is completely black and invisible not only to its prey but also to predators. Astronistes Lucifer It's hard to disagree that one name for the sea creatures in this episode is fancier than another. This fish is named Astronistes Lucifer in honor of its large fangs across its jaw. It lives in the deepest depths of the ocean and is able to glow. Its main habitat is the waters between Australia and New Zealand. The fish has a glowing spur on its chin that attracts other fish. For this, Astronistes Lucifer can be called a fish fisherman because it fishes using its offshoot and then eats the fish. At this point, the creature's not been researched enough and there's very little information about Astronistes Lucifer. Nevertheless, its creepy appearance is enough to make one not want to encounter it. Sea Spider Arachnophobes, if you decide to escape from the spiders chasing you on land directly into the water, I'll disappoint you. They exist even in the deepest and darkest place of the ocean. However, despite their outward resemblances, sea spiders are hardly related to terrestrial spiders. They're not even spiders, but a class of marine arthropods. They inhabit the seas, especially the Mediterranean and Caribbean, as well as the Arctic and Southern Oceans. Currently, science knows more than 1,000 species of sea spiders, which also includes several species at the bottom of the Mariana Trench, the deepest point on the planet. Usually, individuals are from 0 0.03 to just 0.3 inches in size, but some species grow all the way up to 35 inches in length. Viperfish The viperfish is one of the rarest deep-sea predators. Because of its hard-to-reach habitat and lifestyle, scientists have been unable to determine the exact numbers of the species. It's believed that the viperfish can live in deep water for 30 to 40 years. In captivity, it has a much shorter lifespan, only a few hours. Interestingly, the viperfish varies in color. So far, scientists have found green, silver, and blackfish. The distinctive feature of this animal is its massive, fang-like teeth, which it uses to catch its prey. They're so large that they actually extend beyond the mouth and are always visible. The viperfish hunts dragonfish and other small creatures that live at the bottom of the Mariana Trench and in other deep parts of the ocean. By the way, this animal is able to undergo long periods of starvation with complete absence of food. Crown Jellyfish What does this bizarre-looking sea creature remind you of? It looks pretty much like a UFO to me. In fact, it's the crown jellyfish, and like most other jellyfish, it has no digestive, respiratory, circulatory, or central nervous system. It lives at depths of 3,280 to 13,000 feet where no sunlight penetrates. When the animal's frightened, it turns on bioluminescent blue lights, which spin like blinkers on a police car. It looks spectacular and unusual. Sharks living in a volcano The crater of the active submarine volcano Kavachi is a very dangerous but at the same time interesting place for scientists who want so bad to study it better. Since the first recorded eruption in 1939, the volcano has risen and fallen above sea level eight times. During the 2003 eruption, a 50-foot island formed, but it soon disappeared. Now, picture this. A team of researchers arrives at the site and prepares special equipment that can withstand the stated temperatures underwater. People lower the camera, which can stay at a depth of 150 feet for no more than an hour, and see real live sharks. Large sea creatures swim and don't worry about anything. They're not bothered by the high temperature. Moreover, they don't care about the acidity of this environment. And I'm not even talking about a volcanic eruption. What happens to the underwater inhabitants at this point? 
scientists are still unable to give an unequivocal answer. Someone's convinced that the incredible regeneration of fish is to blame. They say such the environment gnaws them, but they quickly recover and find themselves in a vicious cycle. Others believe that the fish were there completely by accident, but somehow miraculously adapted and began to live and develop, even producing offspring. Yeah, people can find all the things in our world, right? Hit the like button if you've never thought that sharks and any other living creatures can live in such conditions. And if now you think that modern representatives have gone crazy, you just don't know how dangerous and unusual the ancient sharks were. I suggest we talk about them. First of all, we're going to talk about Cretoxorina, or as it's also called, the Ginsu shark. The second name, by the way, was given to it by one of the scientists. The shark was named so after the famous brand of knives in the United States. Why the scientist had such an association? Now you'll learn. The Ginsu shark inhabited our planet about 90 to 80 million years ago. At one time, it was not limited to specific bodies of water and could be anywhere at any time. The most striking thing about it is its size. It reached 23 feet in length and weighed almost a ton. But you must admit that size alone would not be enough. Cretoxorina was an extremely dangerous predator. Three-inch teeth helped it to be such, turning its jaws into a real saw, capable of cutting absolutely anything it came across. It could be bone, thick skin, some kind of shell or armor. This ancient giant didn't care. What is there to say if this shark could even eat a dinosaur? Nevertheless, the basis of its diet was not such large creatures. It loved to swallow a prey and think nothing of it. Only if someone pissed it off, or if it was simply too hungry, would Cretoxorina attack even a creature larger than itself. For example, its bite marks have been found on the bones of mosasaurs, the shells of turtles, and even on the fin of Elasmosaurus, a giant plesiosaur. Despite this, although there were traces of its teeth on the bodies of large predators, According to the official version, the shark went extinct precisely because of these very big creatures. Hybotus The fossilized teeth of our next guest were found in 1845 in England. Then mankind learned that somewhere 66 or even 270 million years ago, there lived a shark called Hybotus. To distinguish it from the rest is quite simple and at the same time a little bit difficult. These creatures had kind of horns peculiar only to them which were clearly visible in any water. At the same time, history knows more than 60 species of this shark. But what was the power of Hybotus? What allowed it to occupy some niche and evolve in such difficult conditions? If we had asked this question to the shark, it would have said, glub, 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 which in translation from the old fish language means, my secret is simplicity and plainness. While others were trying to gain muscle mass and become the largest and most dangerous predators, this predator was burrowing somewhere in the bottom and was in no hurry to clash with anyone. Simply didn't need it. This strategist fed on small fish and other slower creatures. Stability and labor allowed Hybotus to settle from the Triassic to the Cretaceous period in almost all the seas of the planet. Occasionally, however, when it did come time for battles and fights, this intellectual would have an ace up its sleeve. I'm talking about its dorsal fin. The trick is that that's where Hybotus had a hidden sharp spine that could be spread and plunged into its opponent's throat or wherever. As for the horns I mentioned at the beginning, their purpose is still unknown. However, there is an option that the shark also needed them for self-defense. Helicoprion The next shark in our episode was apparently an avid fan of chewing tobacco or other such nasty things. Well, jokes aside, all this stuff will not spare your lips exactly the same way as Helicoprion was not spared by evolution. This creature of the oceans lived quite a long time ago, more than 250 million years ago to be more precise. Scientists believe that the length of the shark could reach 40 feet, and it was one of the most fierce and powerful representatives of the underwater world. But as you already understand, the trick here is not the size of this monster of the depths. The main strength and feature of the fish is its jaws. Moreover, for a long time, the creature was generally known only by the tooth spirals. Shark teeth were recognized in the fossils. However, it turned out to be no easier to understand how this thing can be integrated into the design of the living organism than to build a car from scratch. I mean it. People have seen this fish like this, like this, and even like this. Pick anyone you like. Although, in general, strange jaw shapes for cartilaginous fish are still in the order of things today. Let's remember at least, for example, the notorious sawfish. 
And even if we set aside the fact that the jaws could be in any place, do any of you have any idea how they could have been used? Were they movable? Did they stand in one place or did they function like a circular saw at all? To this day, scientists cannot give an unequivocal answer to all these questions. They leave room for imagination. So why not share your opinion on this in the comments? Megalodon. Well, this predator, as it seems to me, does not need any introduction at all. People read books where its name comes up, watch movies in which the shark pesters everyone and everything in its path, or watch episodes of this YouTube channel. This giant, which became extinct about two and a half million years ago, was simply anomalous in terms of size and occupied a unique ecological niche, which is why its behavior was significantly different from the behavior of any other predators. By the way, here's a fun fact. Despite the fact that megalodons seem to us very large, bloodthirsty, and toothy sharks, the prehistoric monster had much more in common with whales. First, megalodons were warm-blooded. That is, they could maintain a constant body temperature, unlike today's sharks. Second, megalodons moved at about the same speed as whales do today. They were characterized by low stamina and a slow metabolic process. Everyone always says megalodon was big. It was anomalous gigantic, but no specific numbers are given. Well, this fish could reach 50 feet in length and weigh more than 40 tons. The impact force of the adult shark was so powerful that the shark could break through the chest cavity of a cetacean, a whale-eating shark. What could be more epic? Of course, when there's such super predator in history, everyone wants to believe that it's still lurking somewhere in the depths of the ocean to this day. Many people think that right now the shark is hiding underwater somewhere at the very bottom of the oceans and feeding on small fish. But such dreamers don't take into account one simple fact. It's because of the lack of food that Megalodon became extinct. This huge shark physically cannot eat only small fish because it simply doesn't have enough food to live on. Megalodon is obliged to hunt often, to hunt large animals, which is exactly the price nature took for such great abilities and incredible strength. And that's not even to mention the changed oxygen levels in the air. In those days, it was much higher, which caused animals and plants to grow to an incredible size. Today, this isn't the case, and it's physically impossible for Megalodon to regain its former glory. Stethacanthus As you may have noticed, millions of years ago, the question of aesthetics, beautiful appearance, colorfulness, and stuff like that was of little interest to fish. Nevertheless, there was one among them that stood out against the general background. It was a real swimming example of what will happen if you don't listen to your elders. Stethacanthus itself was a relatively small fish for those times. Its length could vary from 2.2 to 6.5 feet. Such a size didn't allow the fish to show off at the top of the food chain, but the fish also didn't have to be afraid of everyone. Most probably, its diet consisted of small fish, mollusks, and probably benthic organisms like trilobites and crustaceans. Nevertheless, it also had something that made it stand out from the rest. I'm talking, of course, about its unusual dorsal fin. Having a wide and slightly thickened upper part, it looked like either an anvil or an ironing board. Because of what, in scientific circles, Stethacanthus is seriously called an ironing board. On the flat surface of the fin, there were many jagged scales, which were also on the head of the underwater inhabitant. They helped it to defend itself, and in some cases, even to camouflage itself. Megalodon, Stethacanthus, and other ancient creatures became extinct long ago. But the next animal in our episode is so tough and resilient that it was able to survive even the Ice Age. Muskox the muskox is the only modern representative of the bovid family. They're large, stocky mammals with a large head and short neck, covered with very thick fur. Musk oxen have sharp, rounded horns with a massive base on their foreheads, which they use to protect themselves from predators. Musk oxen themselves are herbivores. They have long and thick fur that hangs almost to the ground. It consists of long, coarse, covering hair and a thick, soft undercoat which is eight times warmer than sheep's wool. It's so warm that it's used to insulate spacesuits for spacewalks. If the musk ox did not have such warm wool, it would definitely not have made it to our times. Even in ancient times, the ancestral habitat of musk oxen was not pleasant. They lived in the cold highlands of Central Asia. 
When it became even colder three and a half million years ago, the ancestors of musk oxen descended from the Himalayas and spread across Siberia and the rest of northern Eurasia. During the penultimate glacial period, musk oxen entered North America vying the Bering Isthmus and also spread into Greenland. Survival Despite the difficulties, musk oxen continued to exist successfully. Although it was not always easy, it was especially difficult for them during the late Pleistocene, several tens of thousands of years ago. Firstly, the climate was changing, and secondly, at that time, there were already primitive people who began to hunt these creatures. But even that didn't break musk oxen. They adapted to the new conditions and also survived the late Pleistocene extinction. It was during this period, which coincided with the Ice Age, quite a few of the animals I talked about in the beginning disappeared. But musk oxen were not affected. These powerful creatures were among the few ungulate animals that survived the extinction of the Ice Age. Reindeer and bisons were also among the lucky ones. Musk oxen outlived many animals, including mammoths, with which they lived side by side for a long period of time. Discovering and Description Let's move closer to our time. The musk ox was first discovered for Europeans by Henry Kelsey, an Englishman working for the Hudson Bay Company. It happened in 1689. Later, scientists began to study musk ox gradually, but could not and still cannot define its exact systematic position. Some scientists attributed musk oxen to the bovini subfamily, others attributed musk oxen to the caproni subfamily, which also includes goats and mountain sheep. The musk ox has features and parameters common to both the bulls and the sheep. However, the musk ox is not a hybrid. By the way, the name of this tenacious animal comes from the fact that the meat of males, and sometimes females, can strongly recall musk. As for males and females, the differences between them are substantial. On average, a musk ox reaches a height of 130 to 150 centimeters, 260 centimeters in length, and weighs about 350 kilograms. At the same time, in captivity, males can fatten up to 650 kilograms. Females are about 50 to 60 percent smaller than males in terms of weight. Present Time The modern range of musk oxen is not very large, but it nevertheless covers quite a few countries. Musk oxen inhabit areas of North America. Many musk oxen live in the very north of Canada as well as in Alaska. They also live in Greenland. In the last century, musk oxen were brought to Sweden and Norway, where they live to this day. And of course, quite a few musk oxen live in northern Russia. The main population resides on the Tamir Peninsula and Wrangell Island. These bulls also live in the polar Urals, in the north of Yakutia, and in the north of Magadan Oblast. In general, these creatures live in the Arctic, in very, very harsh conditions. But the conditions are no stranger to them. In the process of evolution, musk oxen have acquired a characteristic appearance, reflecting their adaptation to the harsh and cold living conditions. They have no protruding body parts, which is due to the need to reduce heat loss in cold climates. Also, as I said, they are helped by their long and dense fur. By the way, because it's very thick and long, musk oxen look much more massive than they actually are. Food. You won't find much food in such harsh and remote places, but musk oxen don't complain. Sedge, lichen, moss, willow, and wild grasses form the basis of the diet of these herbivores. In the course of evolution, musk oxen have managed to adapt to the extremely scarce food lands of the Arctic. Because the Arctic summer lasts only a few weeks, musk oxen spend most of the year grazing on dry plants that they dig out from under the snow. Before rutting, musk oxen tend to visit natural, solanetsic soils during the snowless season, mostly in the summer months, to obtain macronutrients and micronutrients. Being the residents of the hilly Arctic tundra and polar deserts, musk oxen graze in the mountains in winter, where the wind blows the snow off the slopes, making it easier to find food. In summer, however, musk oxen usually move to places that are richest in food, such as river and lake valleys and low tundra. In winter, musk oxen spend most of their time sleeping or resting to digest the food they've eaten. During Arctic storms, musk oxen lie down with their backs to the wind and, unlike migrating reindeer, spend the winter staying in a small area. Musk oxen tolerate any frost well, but high snows are devastating to them. 
This is surprising because at the same time these animals are able to get food from under loose snow up to 50 centimeters deep. Live Musk oxen are herd animals. They have close social ties which are especially strong among young musk oxen and females with calves. Musk oxen almost always live in groups ranging from 10 to 20 individuals. Since females almost always live in groups, males do not create their harems but try to join and take over an existing group and expel young males from there. Since such groups are protected and maintained by the dominant male, they are considered harems. The newborn calf immediately becomes a member of the group and begins interacting with other herd members, maintaining various types of social contacts, including participation in social games, which are important elements of the herd life. A group of musk oxen is not just a herd that hangs around, it's a full-fledged collective where everyone can help each other. In spite of their weight and slowness, in times of danger, musk oxen quickly form a defensive formation, a kind of living wall. If things get really bad, musk oxen will gallop away. Surprisingly, these large creatures can reach speeds of 25 to 30 kilometers per hour and maintain it for several kilometers. But what creatures do they have to run away from? From other animals, of course. Don't forget that the Arctic is a very dangerous place, and the danger manifests itself not only in the frosts and winds but also in the many predators that live there. The main enemy of musk oxen is the wolf, both gray and Alaskan tundra ones. Polar bears, as well as brown bears and wolverines, also pose problems to musk oxen. As I said previously, when a predator attacks, musk oxen line up defensively or run away. If escape is impossible and it's too late to form a defensive formation, musk oxen form a circle. When the predator approaches, one male of the herd attacks it and returns to the circle. Immediately, other members of the herd approach it. This method of defense is quite effective against all natural predators except one creature. Unfortunately, I'm talking about a human. It's probably the most dangerous enemy of the musk ox. This horned creature is able to defend itself against many predators and even to fight them back. For example, with a powerful blow of its horns, the musk ox can kill a wolf or even wound a bear. However, the musk ox is virtually powerless against humans. The living wall and the circle I spoke about are useless ways of self-defense. The herd, which stands in a circle and covers the young with its bodies, remains motionless when musk oxen are shot with a rifle. In the past, entire herds were easily destroyed in this way, which seriously affected the entire musk oxen population. The musk oxen are hunted for their soft and warm undercoat. From an adult and healthy animal, you can collect from two or more kilograms of undercoat, which can then be sold for good money. The price for the musk ox undercoat ranges from $40 to $80 per 28 grams. That is, if things go well, the hunter can get several thousand dollars for the wool of just one animal. Also, musk oxen are of interest to the hunter because of their meat. As I said, it recalls musk. Such an unusual delicacy can be worth a lot of money. Unfortunately, although musk oxen are a protected species in the Arctic, hunting them is not fully prohibited. In the US, for example, a limited hunting for musk oxen is allowed. A similar plan is planned for Russia where trophy hunting for these powerful animals of the Arctic still exists. Musk oxen need wide dispersal and full protection as a species. Although now the situation is not alarming, with such hunting and poaching rates, everything may change, and very soon the animal that survived even the mammoths themselves and the Ice Age may disappear forever due to human fault. Musk oxen create a living wall to protect their young from predators. but. Have you ever wondered why chickens need a wall made of land? Let's take a look at these and other oddities of the feathered creatures. Strange Behavior of Chickens Those who are often around chickens may have definitely noticed how these creatures burrow into the ground. And if a casual passerby might mistake their actions for some kind of convulsions or attempts to heal their wounds, an experienced poultry farmer will be only happy about it. And now I'll tell you why. The fact is that by burying themselves in the ground, the chickens sort of wash themselves. In addition, this process cannot do without dust, and in turn, it's also important. The fact is that dust settles through the feathers on the skin. 
absorbing excess moisture and fatty secretions. Also, the dust serves to repel parasites that can get into the feathers. This interesting and not very clear at first glance process applies to many other birds as well. So keep in mind, if suddenly some feathered creature will somehow rummage in the ground, don't rush to get it out of there and try to interfere. By doing so, you'll only disturb the process, albeit unusual but natural. Speaking of unusual, here's a bird you're not likely to have heard of before. Nevertheless, it's very beautiful and distinctive. This is the blue-footed booby, a feathered creature found on the American coast of the Pacific Ocean. It's by no means small. The length of the body is about 31 inches with a weight of up to 3.5 pounds. An ordinary day of the blue-footed booby looks like this. It goes hunting, the place of which is only the ocean. There it snatches the prey with its clinging paws and brings it to its home to please itself as well as its chicks. Speaking of chicks and the paws with which the booby hunts, these seabirds have webbed feet. With their help, the feathered creature keeps its babies warm. But this unusual color, by which it can be easily distinguished from any other representative of fauna, is not at all innate. It's assigned to the bird over time due to the pigment carotenoid, which the bird gets from fresh ocean fish. The same color, by the way, does not go unnoticed even by the birds themselves. The fact is that it's by the brightness of the blue that females draw attention to males. The brighter and more saturated their color, the more chances the males have for procreation. Atlantic Puffin I think everyone already perfectly guesses where the next bird inhabits, so I suggest that we go straight to the interesting facts about this not the largest but extremely cute and colorful bird. This seabird rather strongly resembles a penguin. It's distinguished by its fast walking, excellent swimming skills, as well as diving. Thus, the birds are able to develop a speed of up to 50 miles per hour, so it's unlikely to catch up with them or vice versa to run away. Moreover, the Atlantic Puffin can easily hold its breath for about a minute. However, you shouldn't worry about this. After all, the Atlantic Puffin feeds mainly on fish. An alternative in its proper diet can be shellfish or something like that. Curious people are unlikely to get a chance to see how the Atlantic Puffin eats. It's all about the fact that this creature usually eats its prey without driving out. Outside there are clashes only with large individuals. By the way, how many fish a day do you think this bird can eat? Share your thoughts in the comments. I'll give you the answer in 5 seconds. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. The Atlantic Puffin eats about 40 fish a day. Who would have thought we were looking at such a glutton? The Atlantic Puffin, by the way, has the same principle of attracting a female as the blue-footed booby. It's all about the beak and its brightness. After the breeding season, the beak and the skin around the eyes turn faded and gray. Burrowing Owl This bird, although a member of the true owl's family, kicks against the system. Unlike other owls, the burrowing owl does not stay awake at night. On the contrary, it prefers daytime activity. You'll hardly encounter it alone. Most likely, the owl will be in the company of its friends. It lives not on trees but in burrows. In addition, the burrowing owl has quite unusual habits which I will now tell you about. Who would have thought that this activist owl is a fan of bringing home all sorts of feces? Literally. It's actually not a silly whim but a vital process. The whole point is that this bird is quite small. It even had to dress up in desert camouflage during its evolution. Everything is done only to escape from predators, which do not mind eating relatively easy and tasty prey. In order to completely escape from the sight of predators, these owls build entire underground bunkers up to three and a half feet deep. But even this isn't enough for them. They cover each passage to the bunker with other creatures' feces thus repelling snakes or other dangerous animals. Such a technique masks the smell of the burrowing owl and protects the bird against unexpected attacks. Remember the Angry Birds game? The one where you shot with birds and earned points for good shots and past levels? Well, our next guest turned out to be the prototype for one of the main characters of the game, the Red Bird. Meet the Northern Cardinal, also known as the Red Bird. But not only because of its cute and bright appearance can this bird surprise people, its name, for example, was invented for a reason. It refers to Roman cardinals, 
who wore clothes of a similar color. The bird lives in many places, and people helped the bird in this. It first settled in the southeastern United States, but as people planted sunflowers and other red bird-friendly plants, it spread across the continent. If you're still in doubt whether you've ever seen this bird, keep in mind it's very easy to distinguish the red bird from its relatives. Even without taking into account the bright plumage, the secret lies in that unusual wisp of hair and long, bright tail, as well as the habit of always sitting in a tree, hunched over. Since we've often talked about animal colors today, it's worth explaining a bit here as well. The whole secret of the red bird's coloring is in its food. The northern cardinal eats a wide variety of foods, from seeds and fruit to bugs and cicadas, but it's the dogwood berries and grapes that help this feathered creature to turn red. As soon as the cardinal changes its diet, the saturation of its plumage becomes worse. But perhaps the creature's greatest strength is its ability to sing coolly. The cardinal's vocal is often compared to that of a nightingale, but it's hard not to notice the difference. The fact is that among redbirds, only males are allowed to sing. Although there's a trace of distrust of the partner in the mating sense, everything is gorgeous for the birds. The male and the female are inseparable during the whole life. The couple does not part even after their chicks grow up. Raven I'm sure most people associate the black raven with something mystical, something dark, unpleasant, and probably even scary. But don't rush to bury the reputation of this bird. It's much more interesting and versatile than you might think. Not for nothing, the feathered creature is considered a symbol of wisdom since time immemorial. Scientists decided to check it with the experiment, and the results shocked them, to put it mildly. The test involved crows and young children. During one experiment, the crow realized that it was possible to get the remains of food from the gap with a bent wire. It began to bend this wire itself, and small children, as it turned out, didn't think of it. Moreover, crows are very good at sensing any imminent danger. If they suspect something wrong, they'll rather quickly hide food or change their location. In general, a crow is more likely to respond to any such situation jokingly. The internet's full of different videos in which crows playfully pester some animals, not for the purpose of eating them or chasing them away, but just for fun. Crows can take the bark of a tree and use it as a sledge. What other bird would think of such a thing? Also, these feathered sages have learned how to establish contact with dangerous predators. For example, a raven can lead a wolf to a dead carcass in exchange for its permission to eat with it. And if suddenly the wolf decides to betray the raven, then it will not be forgiven just like that. The fact is that these creatures can remember liars. Not immediately, but after the second or third time, the raven will no longer believe the creature that deceived it. Even such a thing as empathy is peculiar to them. It's not uncommon to see shots of a raven lightly touching a dead bird or one of its sick congeners. What is this if not intelligence? But not only birds behave strangely, cats and other pets can surprise no less. A cat bites a hand. Owners of cats, especially active cats, rarely part with abrasions and scratches because fur balls regularly take out all the force of their claws and teeth on their hands. But why do cats do this? In fact, there may be several reasons. For example, biting a hand, a cat may just be playing. This is what cats that were raised incorrectly as kittens do. If you let your kitten play with your hands, then when it grows up, it'll probably continue to do the same thing, only biting will hurt much more. Also, hand biting can mean that a mature and well-mannered cat wants to play with its owner. In most cases, a cat that grabs and bites your hand is imitating hunting behavior. If your cat caught prey, it would bite and scratch and tear it apart. This doesn't mean that your cat really wants to hurt you, it's just doing something instinctive. There are other reasons as well. For example, a cat may bite if it's stroked too long. Cats don't like it as much as you think. Cats also use aggression as communication. So a bite in this case means no, don't, or get off. Also, a cat may bite when it's being cared too much, or vice versa, if it feels threatened or injured. As you can see, cat bites are rather complicated phenomena. You still need to understand what exactly the cat wants from you by biting your hand. 
but with the following behavior of cats, things are clearer. I'm talking about the time when a cat freezes in place with its mouth open and a silly, dumbfounded look. A cat can stand like that for a few seconds, during which time it may seem as if the cat is broken. In fact, this is a reaction called lemon. It's found not only in cats, but also in bulls, buffaloes, and horses. At this point, cats use their second olfactory organ, the nasal organ, which is located above the palate. This is why cats open their mouths slightly to pick up odors in the air. This allows a cat to better smell a particular scent, recognize a threat, smell a female, or, on the contrary, a competitor cat. A cat drops things. It's no secret that cats love to throw things off tables, shelves, and other places where people usually put things. Small items now and then end up on the floor, which often causes cat owners to go crazy. But why do cats do this? In this case, there are two main reasons. First, it's a manifestation of the cat's instincts. Don't forget, all representatives of the feline family are predators, from tigers and lions to the smallest and sweetest house cats. Small objects lying on the table may be seen by a cat as prey, and it'll hunt for it. By dropping things on the floor, cats will make sure that they're not alive and that they cannot be eaten. Usually, cats can still play with the object on the floor for a while, but as a rule, they quickly lose interest in the dropped object. Second, house cats love attention. When cats drop things on the floor, they may attract the attention of their owner. In this way, the owner will stop what they're doing and come over to their pet to spend some time with it. A cat can also do this out of self-interest, so that the owner pays attention to it and feeds it. Speaking of food, all domestic cats have bowls. Some have many of these bowls, separately for water, for wet food, and for dry food. It would seem that everything is very convenient and cool, but many cats act as if they don't like bowls because they get food out of them. And sometimes cats will literally scoop all the food out of the bowl and eat it off the floor. They can do this for a variety of reasons. For example, the bowl may be uncomfortable. Cats' whiskers are very sensitive, so the constant contact with the walls of the bowl makes cats feel uncomfortable. There may also be large pieces of food. When biting off and tearing off hard pieces, the cat's jaws move actively and its head turns. It's uncomfortable to do this in the bowl. So a fur ball pulls the food out onto the floor next to the bowl. If there's not one pet in the house but several, a cat can scoop its food out of the bowl so that it could not be taken away by other animals. The cat takes the obtained prey to a secluded place and finishes its food in complete safety. Finally, again, this can all be explained by hunting instincts. When domestic cats hunt mice, they usually don't eat them right away but play with their prey first. The same can happen with ordinary food. A cat takes it out of its bowl as if it's playing with it, and only after that, the cat eats it. Strange Cat Sounds Now that we've dealt with bowls and food, let's move on to sounds. If you have a cat, you've probably heard your cat make strange noises at least once. Usually, it's like this. The cat sitting on the windowsill suddenly rises and starts chirping. Again, it may seem like the cat is broken or needs to be taken to a repair center, but seriously, this is normal behavior for your pet. A cat starts chirping when its attention is attracted by potential prey. Scientists believe that this is not a hunting click, but a sound of excitement. Even big wild cats get excited in the same way. However, when a cat hunts mice, it doesn't usually chirp, so the reason for the strange sounds may be something else. The inaccessibility of prey. Seeing a fly, bird, or butterfly behind a closed window. Furball understands that it can't reach the prey and it begins to express its anger and discontent with chirping sounds. A cat brings prey. If the prey is still available and the domestic cat manages to catch it, it can do different things, play with it for a while and eat it, or bring it to its owner in its teeth. So cats bring their owners mice, rats, cuddly toys, flowers, laundry, actually anything. The cat's habit of bringing captured mice home to their owners means taking care of their pack. That's what wild ancestors of domestic cats did. Cats brought mice not only as food but also as a learning tool. In this way, a cat can show concern for you, even if you don't eat the mouse. There may be other possibilities. Perhaps a cat wants to play. Maybe a cat is trying to teach you how to hunt, 
Or maybe a cat is so attached to an item that it drags it in its teeth and brings it to you so that you can see how much the cat appreciates it. Either way, by bringing you some prey, a cat is interacting with you as much as possible. I could talk about cats and their behavior for a very long time, but I suggest that we give way to other furry friends because there's a lot to say about them too. Stay tuned to learn the subtleties of dog behavior and find out the oddities in the behavior of our favorite rodents. Let's start with dogs. While cats love to throw things off the table, chirp at the sight of birds, and bite their owner's hands, dogs love to tilt their heads sideways. If you have a faithful dog, it's probably done it more than once, perhaps even today. Scientists believe that a dog tilts its head sideways when it's busy thinking. So the dog is trying its best to figure out what you want from it or what it needs to do. For example, at this time, the dog may be trying to understand or learn the meaning of a word or command. Or the dog may be listening for sounds. Shady. Moo. When it tilts its head, it reflexively positions its ears asymmetrically, which allows it to get more accurate information about the source of the sound. A dog walks in circles. Dogs are fussy animals. They jump on the spot, get in the way, and even walk in circles when they go to sleep before they finally lay down. At times, this can go on for a long time, but there's an explanation. This was the habit that dogs' ancestors had in order to keep themselves safe and create a kind of safe home. Wolves, the ancestors of dogs, slept outdoors in the wild, so they needed to carefully prepare a sleeping place. Modern dogs do the same because their instincts are still in their blood. But if a dog walks in circles while moving around, it could be serious. It may have some kind of disease that needs to be treated urgently. The next point is for those who prefer rabbits to dogs and cats. Rabbits, too, have special behavior. For example, one of their specialties is stomping. Rabbits can tap and stomp with their hind legs, and it looks funny, but the rabbit itself is not amused at this moment. Basically, this behavior means that a rabbit is not happy. Also, stomping can mean that a rabbit is frightened of something. Some females stomp during mating. This means the female is stressed, and the stomping means it's calming itself down. Guinea pigs and sounds Many people like guinea pigs, and quite a few people would like to have them as pets. If you're one of those people, you know that guinea pigs make a lot of different sounds that can drive you crazy. But if you know the meaning of these sounds, things can get a lot easier. For example, cooing or purring means a guinea pig is feeling good and happy. Squeaking means excitement and an attempt to get the owner's attention. But if you hear something that sounds like teeth grinding, leave the guinea pig alone. It's an expression of dissatisfaction, anger, or even rage. And lastly, a little more about rodents. Only this time, let's talk about even smaller ones. I mean hamsters. Probably every person among you has had or has a hamster. Hamster owners are very familiar with the reaction of their pet when it suddenly freezes. A hamster literally freezes and doesn't move. It may even seem that the pet is dead. But usually, in this way, hamsters show fright. Great stress can immobilize the hamster. Some hamsters even imitate their death. So in the nature, hamsters can defend themselves from predators. Other animals do the same thing. For example, possums. Sometimes animals behave strangely for the sake of survival, but in some cases this is caused by unexplained and even mystical reasons, such as on this bridge. Overtown Bridge It's located in Scotland. I should say at once it has nothing to do with the Overton window. Really? Really, really. Okay. That makes me feel so much better. Nevertheless, many people are still interested in it and can't solve the mystery that's been tormenting the minds of scientists for more than 100 years. But first things first. Let's start from the beginning. The structure was designed by architect Milner and construction ended in 1895. The bridge is directly on the access road to Overtown House, a Scottish baronial country estate built 33 years earlier. As for the house itself, it stands on a small hill overlooking the River Clyde. By the way, you can learn about this place not only from the story about the infamous bridge, but also from the 2012 movie Cloud Atlas. According to many legends, this building is cursed, and to this day it's haunted by lots of ghosts eager to eat new guests. But it's not just the house that boasts its dark history. The bridge doesn't have the brightest past either. 
in fact, about a century after it was built in 1994, a grown man threw his own son from a height. Eugene, that was the child's name, unfortunately passed away. The father tried to jump after the child but ironically failed. He was stopped by his wife. Doctors and police arrived. The man was sent for an examination which revealed that he was not mentally healthy. You're not a well man. Stop saying that! Now, a psychiatric hospital awaited him for the rest of his life. And you might be thinking right now, well, there's probably a ghost of a boy or at least a ghost of this man at the bridge now who's pestering the regular citizens. It better be. It wasn't so much ordinary people as it was pets, more specifically dogs, that were at risk. Since the mid-20th century, more than 50 dogs have passed away on this bridge, and about 600 more have made the leap but have survived by sheer luck. There have been cases where pets have jumped off the bridge, survived, come running back to it and made the jump again. Interesting fact, all dogs who succumb to the urge to jump belong to the breed with a long nose. They all lose mind in the same place, between the two ramparts at the very end of the bridge on the right-hand side, and it happens only on a clear day. One wonders, how many different factors can even combine into one? What could be the cause of a strange dog behavior? Let's look into it. The most popular speculation is that the cause of the dog's death is their own sense of smell. It turns out that under the bridge there are a lot of minks, squirrels, mice, and other creatures, which smell is too attractive. Thus, the dogs, smelling easy prey, jump for it and get into trouble. In order to find out whether this theory is true, scientists even conducted a study which proved that the tracks of minks are the most attractive for dogs, and in 70% of cases, they choose them. Moreover, in the 50s, when the story began, these small creatures were first found under the bridge, and their smell, as we know, is most tangible in the daytime, and especially in the dry season. However, this still isn't enough to give an answer for sure. After all, why Overtown Bridge and not any other mink habitat? And why do dogs jump from a specific point and not from anywhere else? Could it be that the animals are deliberately killing themselves? With this question, the researchers of the puzzle went to a canine psychologist who said that such an outcome is impossible. Then people began to go through just all possible outcomes. They thought that somehow the decision to jump was influenced by the sound. They say that from there you can hear the bay where the nuclear submarine is located and it scares the dogs. It was thought to be caused by a creature or spirit living in that place. A version with the spirit of that child is also likely. Nevertheless, no conjecture has yet been able to answer all the questions to set the record straight once and for all. For this reason, locals still harbor strange feelings about the place. Even many people notice that they don't feel the same way they always do when walking around the structure. Maybe it's just self-inflicted, or maybe someone or something really has settled there. In any case, share your guesses in the comments below the video. Animals are hard to understand. Sometimes they behave really strangely, not like their congeners. And the stories don't end at the bridge, of course. Stay tuned to see some curious examples of unusual animal behavior. Pet Bear Sounds extremely strange, don't you agree? After all, big animals are used to living in the woods and leading their specific way of life – when they sleep, hunt game, and the like. Everyone knows that bears are dangerous to humans. There's almost no chance to survive or escape from them. Nevertheless, this doesn't scare the Penalinko family, who tamed the bear and since then he lives with them for many years. Don't rush to think that you can do it too because these guys are animal trainers and they know better than anyone else about the proper treatment of animals. Their story goes back to a market where some hunters were selling a little bear. According to the vendors, the poor thing just got off his parents' back. To be honest, it's hard to believe this. So the Panalinkos took him under their wing and made every effort to melt the animal's wild heart. The bear was wounded and badly frightened, so all the first time they tried to heal his wounds. The long care bore fruit, and very soon, Stepan, that's the bear's name, fully recovered and even learned some circus tricks. Maybe the fact that Stepan grew up among people made him different from all the other bears. He's not aggressive at all. He's never bitten or frightened anyone in his entire life. His caution and tactfulness in communicating with people made Stepan a real star, who's in great demand among all photographers. 
Now the animal has grown and for more than 20 years has been spending time at the home of the Panalinko family. The bear fattened up to 660 pounds, but for those who raised him, he's still that small, harmless and cowardly bear they found at the market. If you think that's where the weirdness of people and stories with exotic animals ends, it doesn't. To prove my point, let's go to Indonesia, where a man has a crocodile living in his house. The story of his domestication is similar to that of the bear. The young man rescued the reptile from cruel children who offended him. Not knowing where to put the crocodile, the man kept him, made a special mini pool where he regularly changed the water, stocked up on food, and that's the kind of idol they've been spending time in for more than 20 years. But it had to end sometime. The information reached the Department of Conservation, which reviewed the case and immediately went there. The authorities took the crocodile away because they considered it a protected animal. The family friend now lives in the local nature reserve. Who knows, maybe it's better that way. Tom and Jerry This cartoon series is a vivid example of how a mouse can fight back a cheeky cat. And yes, you don't see that often in real life, after all, it's against nature. But this mouse is clearly not that simple. Like Mike Tyson or Muhammad Ali in their prime, it stood up and fought back two cats at once. I don't know how that tiny body had room for that kind of courage. Do you think the mouse knew that if it gave leg bail there was a little chance of escape and so it had to fight? Or is it just a tough nut by nature? Share your guesses about the mouse's behavior in the comments. Does anyone know what point is taken from the founding of Rome and who found it? Surprisingly, this story fits perfectly with our topic, so I'll quickly bring you up to speed. The Trojans founded the city of Alba Longa and its ruler was Numitor. Unfortunately, Numitor's brother, Amulius, betrayed him and seized power. This wasn't enough and the man wanted to kill his kinsman's children. He personally killed his son and forced his daughter to take a vow of celibacy and become a priestess in the Temple of Vesta. And so it was. But a few years later, Rhea Silvia, Numitor's daughter, gave birth to a child. Not just one, but twins. Amulius learned of this and, fearing vengeance, ordered that Rhea's children be dealt with. He asked his slave to steal the babies and take them to the river, put them in a basket and send them down the swift current. The order was carried out flawlessly. The satisfied slave returned and told his master everything, but they had no idea that Amulius had miscalculated and that the children would be all right. The water was gone and the hungry twins became audible to the whole forest. The first one to hear them was a she-wolf. It sensed that the twins were hungry and fed them both with its milk. Now the animal regularly came to the place to look after the babies. That was until a passing shepherd found the babies. He took them into his house and gave them the names Romulus and Remus. The two boys became successful warriors who founded Rome at the very spot where the water washed ashore and the she-wolf helped them survive. In confirmation of this legend, archaeologists were able to find the cave in which the babies were presumably kept when they were raised by the animal. By the way, this very place is considered the foundation point of Rome. To pay tribute to the she-wolf, the locals erected a statue cast in bronze. On it, the brave animal is feeding two babies. Diver made friends with a shark. Yes, it happens. Usually these predatory underwater creatures, which have lots of teeth, attack people quickly and without a second thought. But here the story was different. An Australian man befriended a shark, who he said at the time of their first encounter was no more than six inches in length. They quickly made a connection, and the little predator let the diver pet herself. Seven years later, the man's back in the same spot with his now longtime friend, who had noticeably grown up. It's a very curious story as the shark even recognized the guy underwater while he was working and swam up to him to say, hello. The only thing I don't fully understand is how this is possible. After all, his eyes are barely visible in the suit, and the shark somehow has to distinguish his friend from another diver. In any case, the story's touching and very beautiful. And that's all, guys. Which animal behavior surprised you the most? Let me know in the comments. Thanks for watching, and see you later.